Hi, and welcome, and thanks for viewing this discussion about the U.S. Supreme Court's cert petition determination on Monday in Servotronics versus Rolls-Royce PLC at socket number 20-794. I'm Russ Bleemer. I write and edit alternatives to the high cost of litigation for the CPR Institute and John Wiley, and we're back here on the CPR Speaks blog to look at the Supreme Court decision on Monday. They agreed to hear an arbitration case. It means that an important question on the power of foreign arbitrators to gather evidence from the United States is expected to be decided when the case is heard. Presumably, it's going to be in the fall term beginning in October. The issue that the court agreed to decide is specifically whether the discretion granted to district courts in 28 U.S.C. 1782A to render assistance in gathering evidence for use in a, quote, foreign or international tribunal, uh, close quote, includes private commercial arbitral tribunals. In other words, does 281782 apply to arbitration? The fourth and sixth U.S. Circuit Courts of Appeal allowed Section 1782 to be used for foreign arbitration tribunal discovery. The second, fifth, and in the case that is the subject of the petition accepted Monday, the Seventh Circuit found that 1782 does not include private arbitration tribunals and is reserved for courts of state action. Now, this was thought to be settled just a few years ago, completely settled law, and it had been for a long time, but, but not so much now. Over the past couple of years, these cases have sprung up regularly, and the term circuit split that I just illustrated has taken on a special distinction in this case. It hasn't uh, been just a circuit split among a bunch of disparate federal court cases. In fact, the same parties in the case under consideration today litigated the case in the Fourth Circuit with the opposite result of the Seventh Circuit case on appeal and accepted by the court on Monday. In the Fourth Circuit case, discovery under 1782 was permitted. When denied in the Seventh Circuit action, Servotronics, the petitioner here, appealed to the Supreme Court. Now, there are wrinkles. A small one that came out today is that Justice Samuel A. Alito Jr. recused himself from the consideration of and decision to take the case. There's also an issue potentially of mootness. Uh, this arbitration matter is reported to be proceeding in London this spring. The last arbitration case the U.S. Supreme Court heard in December was dismissed as improvidently granted just one month after the court devoted arguments to it in, uh, uh, in December, it was dismissed back in January. Now, is Servotronics going to be moot after a tribunal award and abandoned by the court before the fall term when it would likely would be argued? Uh, it remains to be seen. Following this for CPR throughout 2020 and, and now into this year, here on YouTube and on CPR Speaks and in the pages of Alternatives to the High Cost of Litigation has been John Pinney. John's joining me now. He's counsel to the Graydon Law Firm in Cincinnati. Big disclosure. CPR has an interest in this case via an amicus brief urging the Supreme Court to decide this issue. John Penny wrote that brief for CPR. John, there's basically one question here. What's next? But let's fill in a little more on the legal background that led us to today's decision. Thanks for coming on with us again. Well, uh, good day, uh, Russ, and thanks for inviting me. Uh, I'm delighted to weigh back in now that the case is truly before the Supreme Court. Let me begin with a real brief uh, uh, introduction to Section 1782 in case uh, the listeners may not be fully familiar with this statute. It was enacted in 1964 and it grants discretionary authority to U.S. district courts to compel discovery from U.S. parties for use in, quote, foreign or before a foreign or international tribunal, end quote. Uh, the decisions of the U.S. Circuit Courts, beginning with uh, a case uh, known as the NBC case in the Second Circuit and the Biederman case in the Fifth Circuit, both in 1999 held that private international arbitration tribunals were not foreign or international tribunals within the meaning of Section 1782. The Intel decision, which was the only time that the U.S. Supreme Court has addressed Section 1782 was decided in 2004, and it held that the European Union Directorate General for Competition would be considered to be a, quote, foreign or international tribunal so that an Intel competitor, namely Advanced Micro Devices, could subpoena under 1782 evidence from Intel to support the EU's competition investigation of Intel. 
Uh, that case was the trigger of an explosion of 1782 cases, including a number of cases seeking evidence for international arbitral tribunals, notwithstanding the NBC and Biederman decisions. However, it was not until 2019 that any case made its way to a federal court of appeals, resulting in a decision parting with the 1999 decisions in NBC and Biederman. That case was Abdul Latif Jamil Transportation versus FedEx out of the Sixth Circuit, which disagreed with uh, NBC and Biederman, creating the initial circuit split. Russ, as you mentioned, uh, that case was shortly followed by the first Servitronics case, Servitronics versus Rolls-Royce, where the Fourth Circuit in March of 2020 uh, issued a decision agreeing with the Sixth Circuit. And then there was a parallel case which had been simultaneously brought by Servitronics in Chicago, the headquarters of Boeing, uh, where the Seventh Circuit uh, after waiting a year, uh, decided in September 2020, uh, the other way in essentially the same case had, as had been decided by the Fourth Circuit, which of course increased the circuit split and even created a circuit split in the same case. Uh, Servitronics, having lost in the Seventh Circuit, filed for cert in December of 2020. And as you mentioned, uh, uh, the CPR Institute in a and an, an amicus brief written by me uh, supported Servitronics uh, cert petition, but not necessarily the merits of Servitronics position that 1782 ought to apply to private international arbitrations, but rather that it wished to emphasize to the court the critical nature of the circuit split and the consequences in terms of wasted time, money, and effort in litigating over this issue unless the Supreme Court weighed in. It's an important uh, point, John. I appreciate that. Um, after 15 years, it took for this split to develop and arise, during which time we thought it was, it was, it was settled law. It, it, it arose with a vengeance. I tried to hunt it down, and I'm sure it's happened before, but it ha has, certainly isn't a common occurrence to have basically the same case, the same parties, the same almost the exact same issues come up in different circuits and, and, and be the source of that of that split. So that was one reason why, uh, and a big reason why uh, CPR urged that this needed to be cleared up because the divergent points in the circuits were, were, were of a huge magnitude. Well, especially in terms of, you know, forum shopping on one hand, and also just the uncertainty creates uh, the potential for uh, substantial litigation before a jurisdictional litigation, I should say, before uh, a court even gets to the merits of whether or not it should allow for the requested discovery. Mm -hmm. uh, by way of just very brief background, Servitronics had brought the 1782 discovery uh, petition to seek depositions and documents from Boeing because the underlying arbitration is a claim by Rolls-Royce seeking indemnity from Servitronics for a settlement Rolls-Royce had to pay to Boeing for a jet engine fire on a Boeing 787 aircraft. Uh, the fire occurred in Charleston, South Carolina, and of course, Boeing's headquarters are in Chicago, and that gave rise to the simultaneous 1782 petitions, both in South Carolina of the Fourth Circuit and uh, Chicago, which is in the Seventh Circuit. Uh, uh, and as I mentioned, uh, the uh, principal urging uh, in the uh, amicus brief that we filed on behalf of CPR was both to take the case uh, for the Supreme Court, but also to urge the court to decide the case this term, if at all possible. Well, it looks like it will not be decided this term now because the April final argument calendar was just recently set, it did not of course include a case where cert was just granted today. Uh, uh, now- Today meaning Monday, March uh, 22nd, for those of you watching later this week, but it raises this, this mootness issue. Indeed, and uh, there have been filings 
uh, in the various U.S. courts relating to the ongoing 1782 cases where there have been uh, reports of applications and rulings by the London Arbitration Tribunal hearing the arbitration case brought by Rolls-Royce against Servitronics. And that case is set for final hearing on May 10th, uh, just a, a month and a half from now. Uh, and as a consequence of that, uh, it would be almost uh, certain that unless the tribunal changes course, uh, they will likely issue a final award sometime before the fall term of the Supreme Court begins in October of 2021. Then that raises the, the collateral issue is, does a final award make the Servitronics uh, case before the Supreme Court moot? Uh, certainly, uh, there's that possibility because once the final award is issued, there is obviously no need for the evidence being sought by Servitronics through the 1782 petition. John, you expect the uh, respondents, Boeing and uh, Rolls-Royce, will, will take action upon in a final award? Probably within 10 minutes of receiving it, they, they will do <laughs> that so. That long, huh? <laughs> okay. Um, uh, now, what does that mean as a practical matter? Well, it means is that the Supreme Court will be faced with, with a dilemma because uh, part of our filings uh, in support of the cert petition emphasized the fact is that it took basically 20 years for a case to reach a court of appeals with a final decision from the NBC and uh, Biederman cases when the Sixth Circuit decided it. And the reason for that is, is actually quite simple. And, and the principal reason is, is that discovery is a collateral matter. It's not mm -hmm. directly uh, touching on the merits of the case so that uh, parties uh, may think they need third party evidence uh, to support their case and they, they probably have good reason to do so, but there's limits both in terms of the expense they're willing to incur in fighting over the uh, uh, question as to whether they can secure the, the evidence that they seek exist with the third party. And then as we see here in the Servitronics case, the willingness and patience of arbitral tribunals to postpone proceedings uh, while parties litigate over collateral evidentiary issues from third parties is obviously limited. Take for example, the Servitronics case. In Servitronics, uh, the arbitration was commenced in uh, I think the late summer of 2018 before a tribunal was even constituted in that case in London, Servitronics filed the two parallel 1782 petitions in the District of South Carolina and the Northern District of Illinois. Those cases were litigated uh, first in the district court and the district court uh, denied those applications both in, the, in South Carolina and Chicago. Uh, and then they went up to the courts of appeals. Well, it was 18 months before the Fourth Circuit weighed in and roughly two years uh, before the Seventh Circuit weighed in. And now we're two and a half years out. Mm -hmm. All the while the arbitration proceeding in London had been to a significant degree uh, on hold. Uh, but now there has been filings that the uh, tribunal has said uh, our patience is exhausted. They are going to proceed with a virtual hearing uh, you know, on May 10th, according to their interim award issued last month, uh, and have downplayed the significance of the, uh, uh, of the uh, evidence sought by Servitronics. Mm -hmm. Now, that, that isn't a terribly long timeline for, for the litigation, but with the arbitration underway, um, as, you, as, as you had said, John, the, the tribunal just, just lost its patience. It's ready to roll, and apparently that's exactly what will happen in May. Now, the, the, the same effect is happening, presumably, in the other cases. We're going to put a link to our earlier blog post on Monday about the, um, 
the Supreme Court's cert grant, which, which leads back to John's earlier work, which discusses the many cases that are pending now. But the status is kind of the same. They have arbitrations, which are presumably more or less ready to go, but they're waiting on circuit decisions on this around and about. Those probably will also proceed before a decision is reached on the 1782 question. There are two cases pending in the Third Circuit and a case pending in the Ninth Circuit, which uh, whichever way they're decided, and, and as a practical matter, it looks like uh, they're fully argued and ready to be decided, and the courts are likely awaiting what the Supreme Court uh, did on cert and perhaps uh, waiting for the merits of those cases. But they have the same underlying mootness questions that, uh, that the Servitronics case has. And it is, uh, I would say, uh, probable that Servitronics, if uh, the case went ahead, and, and especially if they lost the case, uh, that they would bring annulment proceedings and or challenges mm -hmm. under the New York Convention. And therefore, it's, I think, a fascinating legal issue as to whether that th uh, slender thread would be enough to uh, keep the Supreme Court from concluding that the cases have become moot. Because in theory, if the uh, award was set aside or unenforceable, there could be uh, further proceedings uh, uh, brought by Servitronics, either in arbitration or potentially otherwise, that would continue to allow that evidence to be relevant. Mm -hmm. So that pretty much covers uh, the issue for the day. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, and uh, you know it will be interesting to see what happens probably sometime in the summer or early fall uh, if the Servitronics uh, merits hearing goes forward and an award is issued because there'll probably be another round of litigation before the Supreme Court on the issue of mootness. Yeah, we're gonna be watching for the, for the quote unquote motion practice in the arbitration in London and see what comes out of that, see if it goes forward. Uh, we hope you'll, uh, you'll, you'll join us as that moves along. And we'll see if, if when that award comes out, how it proceeds down the road. Uh, anything you want to add, John? I really appreciate you, you wrapping it up like this. It was re really interesting. Is there any last words, any key takeaways? Uh, uh, nothing other than stay tuned. And uh, well, I will say one other, one other thing is, is that, uh, as I mentioned at the uh, top of our conversation, Russ, uh, is that uh, there's a wide disparity of views as to whether or not, as a matter of policy, arbitral tribunals ought to uh, allow the invocation of 1782 uh, for third party discovery uh, from uh, parties located in the United States. Uh, we're not going to undertake that debate at this moment. Uh, but nonetheless, I think irrespective of where one comes out on that policy issue, arbitral tribunals would be well advised to give careful consideration of addressing 1782 issues, say at a preliminary conference, and in particular uh, following the IBA rules, uh, which uh, direct parties to first seek permission from the tribunal before seeking evidence from third parties. Thank you, John, for ending on a practice point. I really appreciate that. And although although he was reluctant to go further into the policy issues, we'll put a link uh, below. And uh, John has developed some of that, some of those policy issues in, in our earlier material. So you'll be able to link to that. But thanks for ending on practice. And John, thank you very much for sorting it out again today. Looking forward to doing it again as developments merit. Uh, happy to do so. Thanks, Russ.